on purpose. Yeah. So. Daisy like Dan, Daisy Danielle. Oh, I have papers. Did everyone, except maybe the lads, have a good Christmas? Or were you feel, was everybody oh, better I by then? My mom's better now. Oh, I my dad felt really good. Well, over Christmas, I know that the Smiths and uh, and our family uh, got COVID. Yeah. In one form oh. or another. This is your, um, yes. Oh, okay. So does anybody have, I asked you to write the answer to this makes of your Wait, is that the paper? That, the paper oh. that was doing? That's the paper. Yes. That's it. <coughs> um, do you guys have your blue book answers? Or oh, I thought we were supposed to, I kept them at home. That's fine. Because I fine. figured it was just no, for my fine. parents. No, that's fine. If you have... Well, I can bring it next week. Yeah, because I'd love to read what you can. Can my mom, like, send them to you? Oh, yeah. Email sure, sure. How about you guys? I need to get my paper for next week. I do not know if we're doing it for Blue Book. No, like, no. Like, because, yes, my yes. mom doesn't tell me any emails, okay. I guess. Do you, so I'll just give you, well, I sent you my paper for a Tales of City through email. So, like, you, you should have my email. Oh, did you do that today? Or did you come it's I labeled it Tales to City paper. Yeah, you know I I do remember, really, but why don't I have it? Yeah. Okay. You know what? Forgot about my. So everybody, yeah. like, give me grace today. I like it. Just it's, I get you. It I, is hard to get back in the saddle. You know what I mean? I know. And now, um, it's unfortunate. My Tuesday kids are a week ahead of you guys. Yeah, I know. So you I, I yeah, and so now my brain, like I did next week's lesson yesterday, and now I'm. So just if I say something that's nonsense or I forget your papers, please like be yeah, gracious. Fine. If I can't find it, um, I will try to remember or have your mom email me you or you email me. The reason I emailed it to you is because my Word app on the computer is not loading whatsoever, and so I don't really have another way of. It's it okay. I can handwrite it. Oh, but no, no, there's no re reason, reason for that. Um, I just want to make sure that you are sending it to the right email. Yeah, yeah it should bounce back, though, I would think, if it went to the wrong savvy, address. So. Oh, okay. I'm, not I, I'm not either, but I send stuff out, and it sends it back and says, this is undeliverable, and I'm like, oh, I must have done something wrong. Um, so let's just be gentle with each other today and try to get back into the swing of things. No, that is I'm not gentle. It did not seem gentle at all. We'll jump down um, the boxing glove. Let's go. I believe, <laughs> <Excuse us. laughs> back in the dim recesses of my memory from December, that I gave you Elizabeth Barrett Browning yes, you did. poetry. And the famous, How Do I Love Thee? Let Me Count the Ways, which it is kind of trite. People use those opening lines a lot, but it's really a very, very deeply beautiful poem. I hope that you enjoyed it. The second one was about the flowers. You remember, you kind of remember? Pull it out, sorta. Yeah, I you know what? just read them like yesterday. Okay, so see that's good, that. that's good. I don't, ex if you read this three or four weeks ago, and I don't really believe any of you read these poems out loud every day through the entire Christmas break. No, I read I'm so, I don't at believe the beginning. That. <laughs> And then I saw it yesterday when I was writing my essay, and I was like, oh, I probably have to read this again, so I have some sort of knowledge of it. I thought you gave us La Belle Dame Sans Merci and On the First Looking Into Chapman's Home. That was the week before, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Oh, yeah, was, the brownie. You hear that one week. Oh. Oh, I emailed it to your mother. Oh. I'm so sorry. Is this an okay time to interrupt? Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Two seconds. Whew. Those <sighs> stairs, I know. Um, what kind of pizza do we want? Sausage, definitely. Gotta be on there somewhere. Do you like pepperoni also or just yeah. sausage? Yep. I mean, mega meat is my favorite. Sausage, no mushrooms. Honey. Or olives. Agreed. What? And you you like, like, I despise mushrooms. Pizza is so divisive. Like cheese, pepperoni, sausage. I think everybody would be. I want to make sure. Taco pizza, real pizza. I want to make sure. Yes! It's, it's more so expensive, good. though. Pineapple is okay, don't money is no object. Our New Year's celebration. So, like, um, 
Does I anybody like else like pineapple? I like pineapple. I mean, you're gonna I'm not eating it. I have to have a lunch date at Chili's at noon. Sorry, pineapple. I have a wrestling meet on Friday, so I can't eat anything. I have a set meal. Um, that's too heavy. Yeah, that's how I'm going to have fun at lunch. <laughs> All right. What do we all get? What do we all Pineapple, I guess. It's Here, I'm going to use this yeah. time to pass out our new pineapple. All right, I'm sorry. No, it's fine. Um, as a cream? What would you like on your song cheese pizza? Pepperoni. Pizza is pizza, and I will eat it. <laughs> you want no matter that's what a nice is. attitude. Unless <laughs> it has mushrooms on it. If it has mushrooms on it, I will not eat it. Mushrooms and black olives are no. And Jacob, I'm, I'm you don't really eat anything. Olives. You like salt and pepper on me? I like salt and pepper on me. I like mushrooms. I like the black ones. You have to like mushrooms and olives. None of us do. I know. I'm Mexican. I like everything. The universal three, the universal pepperoni, sausage, cheese. Everybody will be satisfied. Carl, no are you a sausage and pepperoni Sorry. guy? I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it. I know. No. Keep Carl will eat Maybe anything. a supreme. I will eat it. What's a supreme? It just has like veggies on it as well. It has it it isn't poison. Carl will eat it. Somebody will probably eat it. If it is poison, Carl might eat it anyway. Sure, you don't want anything. <laughs> It'll be okay. He's so big. He's, he's huh? such a tall guy. It'll just have rice. Okay. Shit. Literally, I feel like if Carl. Little was known fact. I'm pretty sure that pepperoni pizza is what the gods eat on Mount Olympus. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's it. Oh, I'm guessing. Okay, sorry. On the subject of Carry on. pizza, um, we had like a. Uh, oh gosh, I forgot what it's that's called. A thing to remember, like the. Um, the names of the countries in South America. Okay. And so, like, the first letter of oh. each one we would change into a different word. So, our sentence was Vikings can eat pizza because yeah. cooking alligators usually produces bad fumes. So gross. That's very good. It's a mnemonic device. Yes. That. Yes. I did a geography where it's like the names are like, it relates to things. It's like Ghana. Togo, see Benin in Nigeria. Ghana, Togo, Benin, Nigeria. Hmm. But we used to do the, you know, the sing around the world. The, the Yakos. Yakos tapes. Yeah. That, that all the, and, mm, and, and, and yeah. United States, Canada, and, and we and sang it and over and over, and like in the van, we had a cassette. Oh and then my three-year-old, once her sister complained that in the night, she just kept singing, ah. New Hampshire, Maine. New Hampshire, Maine, because that would be into the East Coast. Anyway. Okay, there back a, to, oh, okay, one more comment. There was a meme about that song with the, all the countries of the world. Oh, yeah, that's so a go-to It meme. said, countries infected with COVID, and then just oh, played the yeah. song. Okay, we are going to. Oh, the Wacko song? We are going to start talking about something that we're supposed to be talking about. Yay! <laughs> um, as time, I'm going to go ahead on the clock. Um, so, did anybody notice, I asked you back to Elizabeth Barrett Browning and her flowers. What does she give back to him? Um, she gives back, um, in one line she said like, um, like her thoughts of like love and stuff. And, thoughts. Um, can you, just so I don't have to get up, can you read like to where she starts talking about the thoughts? Just read a few lines. Um, so in the like name of that love of ours, take back these thoughts which here unfolded to you, and which on warm and cold days I withdrew from my heart's ground. And read, read some more. Um, Your indeed, favorite. those beds and bowers be overgrown with bitter weeds and rue. Yes. Oh, that is. Uh, uh, thorns. And weeds bed. wait thy reading, yet here's... Oh, Eglantine. Egg, Eglantine. Okay, that's that's good. So, I love this. Not only are they her thoughts, her flowers that she gives back are her thoughts, but they're thoughts she's pulled out of the ground of her heart. And the ground of her heart is overgrown. It needs weeding because he's not there to weed them. And it's just like, I know, you're being silly. Like, you're yeah. mocking me slightly. But no, it is... No, it's him. It is... I, what we call it, like an epic metaphor or simile. Do you know what I mean? It's not like, my heart is like a garden and here's my flower thoughts. It's, my heart is a garden, but it's overgrown with weeds, but yet 
you know, it needs your reading, but I can find beautiful things. And at the very end, the part I didn't have you read, she says, but remember that their roots are still left in mind. You know, when you give people flowers, you cut them, right? Mm -hmm. And because it would be weird to do <laughs> with the roots and the dirt hanging, you know? And e either way, they're out of the ground. But these thoughts she's giving are still connected to her. She didn't cut them out and give them like you do flowers. She said, remember the roots are still in mind. We're still connected when you remember these thoughts. I think it's lovely. Moving on. I have just given you Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. You are probably already very familiar with a Longfellow poem because he is the author of The Midnight Ride of Paul Revere. Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. On the 18th of April in 75, hardly a man is now alive who remembers that famous day and year. It's very long. I have not memorized the whole thing. One of my children did. I used to know most of it, but I've lost it. I and memorized it's, the, yes. that like five. It's great. It's got a very solid meter, so it's, it's mm -hmm. kind of easy to memorize because of that. He also wrote a long poem called The Village Blacksmith, which is popular to force children to memorize as well. I'm not giving you either of those poems, but if you are not familiar, especially with The Midnight Ride of Paul Revere, that's worth looking up. It's worth five minutes of your time. Is it not, Maggie? It is. To classic. read classic. <laughs> However, I've given you two much shorter poems to aid you in the whole reading out loud every day project. Longfellow is our first American author of the year. We have not had any other Americans. Why have we not had any Americans yet? Because America hasn't even been a country yet. Yeah, because America wasn't a country for very long. Remember we were just reading Thomas Paine Common Sense and the Federalist and Anti-Federalist papers? So it takes some time, right? Most of Americans at that point were English. Other European have mostly English. And so yeah, their literature mind. was English. I mean, if you wanted to read a good book, you didn't go get an American author. You sent back to England, and they brought you books on a boat, and you read Jane Austen. You may. Um, but it, do not hurt yourself. Don't die first. It was kind of an obstacle course back there. Hey, Jacob, careful on the stairs. <laughs> Got it? Oh, oh there's one right there. Oh, careful one right there. on the stairs anyway. <laughs> okay. Where have you been last right. semester? Longfellow was one of the first legit American poets um, that made the world stand up and say, oh, those Americans, they actually have people that can write. However, not everyone thought he was just all that in the bag of Skittles, as they say. Um, Edgar Allan Poe being one of them. Poe, who unfortunately we're not going to be reading together. My other students are reading Poe, but I think you've already read. Tap, like, didn't tap, you have? Tap. Scary. I, I heard it um, read by, seven. you know the person who played Count Dracula, uh, Sheriff, who's the white wizard in Lord of the Rings, Sheriff Tower. Christopher Lee. Yeah, Christopher Lee, he read it, and I saw that on YouTube, and his voice just goes perfectly yeah. with the reading. Um, Saruman, Poe, that's the person. Saruman, I yes. Poe was a writer and a poet, but he was also a literary critic, and he just had nothing good to say about Longfellow. He thought Longfellow was trite and bland, and he wasn't like high literature, you know, he was popular. He was writing for the masses, and Poe was not interested in the masses. Poe had some issues. Yes. Poe po has some good poems. Uh, and we're actually going to read some of his poems. We're just not going to read any of his short stories. So I chose two of them. Uh, the first one, The Tide Rises, The Tide Falls. And I would just like to write, read the first stanza. Just listen. Because remember, poetry is about the message, but it's about the sound. It's like, you know, when you listen to music, you don't only listen to music because you like the lyrics, right? Mm -hmm. It's excellent if good music and good lyrics combine, but, um, but both are happening. And so poetry is not just the message that the poet wants to send, it's the sound that he uses to send it. 
And sometimes you like the song, but you hate the lyrics. So yes, or well, not very much the other way. But yes, some some music is, and that's the danger of music, right? Some music really seeps into your soul, but the lyrics can be just not something you want to feed your soul with. Like every pop song currently ever. See, I don't think that applies to the 70s, movies, but it does, unfortunately. Um, in fact, my favorite, one of my favorite Billy Joel songs is Only the Good Die Young, which is not a good message, although it's rather ironic, you know, and mocking, but anyway. But you just, when it comes on, when the music starts, you're like, this is awesome! And then you start thinking about like, no, I really shouldn't. It's hard. It there is these hard. two really great albums I found, actually, surprising. But they're like, it's kind of like poetry and music together. Mm. And well, like speaking of poetry and music cool together, stuff. I actually have two CDs, um, one of which is American poetry set to music, and one of them is The Tide Rises, The Tide Falls. Hmm. Yeah, I should bring that next week. Okay, let me read the first stanza. The tide rises, the tide falls. The twilight darkens, the curlew calls. Along the sea sands, damp and brown, the traveler hastens towards the town, and the tide rises, the tide falls. I'm not going to read the whole thing because I want you to read it, but listen to that line. The tide rises, the tide falls. Do you hear it rise and fall? Mm -hmm. Rises, falls. It is woe because I would never in a million years come up with that. I'm not a poet. Finish your the tide it. rises, yes. There was more to that, too, but I'm going to preserve it. Um, and then I want to look at the bottom of Snowflakes. I want to read the first stanza of it. Out of the bosom of the air, out of the cloud folds of her garments shaken, <coughs> over the woodlands brown and bare, over the harvest fields forsaken, silent, soft, and snow de slow descends the snow. Silent, soft, and slow descends the snow. Listen to the alliteration. Oh my goodness. But and it's so calm, it's peaceful. You know how when it snows it gets really quiet? Like it absorbs the sound. As soon as you step outside when there's fresh snow, it just seems like everything is hushed. It's really quiet, especially if you're not in town and there's not traffic noises. That that's how I feel when I read that. Silent, soft, and slow descends the snow. And it almost descends. Anyway, read them out loud because that's the best way to really get the sound. Yes. Sorry, here's my hand first. Oh, uh, I didn't even see his hand, so you were going to win anyway. Thank Sorry. You. But um, are we still like memorizing? Poetry? I yes. I want I, you to I memorize. I was about a poem. to memorize something, so I found my love. But um, I realized I actually know a lot from memory because we have. My mom's always made us memorize Shakespeare, like passages. Good for her. So I could just say one right now. But lay it on us. I have to think of one though. Oh, yes. This is from, gosh, I can't even, why do I, oh, I always forget the name of it, A Midnight Summer Dream. Oh, okay. Um, but this is my favorite one. It's, um, I know a bank where wild thyme grows, where ox lips and the nodding violet blows. Quite over canopied with luscious wood vines, with sweet musk roses and with eglantine. There sleeps Titania some time of the night, lulled in these dreams with dances of delight. And there the snake throws her enameled skin, weed wide enough to wrap a fairy in. And with the juice of this I'll seek her eyes and make her full of fan hateful fantasies. Thank you. And then she gets the potion and falls in love with, with a the guy donkey. with a donkey head. Okay. <laughs> what fun. Thank you. You you know that one, don't you? I don't have it memorized, but I do know that. I can tell you story. Yes, I do. Uh, what did you want to say? I was just raising my hand because you raised your hand. Oh. You're just in the mood, aren't you? <laughs> it's just the way it is. I've, it's had, a, I've had a lot of apple juice. My, my husband said he thought my brain was sugar-coated. Like, literally, no, 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 I, came in, in I came in with a full thing of apple juice. Yeah, he did. So I'm going to be like Lots of energy. Okay, let's move on to real stuff. Not this that poetry was real stuff. I was surprised. Like, we awesome. go on for a while just talking exactly about this word. deep emotion. And I was like... This monster has a lot of emotion for a monster. <laughs> this monster has a lot of emotions for a monster. If the ending caught me totally by, by surprise, I didn't even know it would go that way. Ooh. Okay, so let me let me see my notes. Let me see where I want to start because there's plenty to talk about. Um, 
Chapter let's three. let's start because I'm going to have you guys start a new paper, and let's start because other things are going to get woven in. And actually, I'm going to move the camera so that it faces the. There, it makes. Maybe you don't want to be the star. Can you? Okay, so that we can see the um, board. Because we're going to do a little A and I chart together. So get out a piece of paper. And you guys can just kind of flip your phones around. Because talking about this topic will bring in a lot of other stuff in the story. Hang on. Those markers aren't very good. Okay. Here we go. You guys are all familiar with this, right? A, affirmative. N negative, and we just never get any eyes. If you get any eyes, we'll add an eye color. Here's the question. Should Victor have made the monster a companion? No. Oh, so hang on. So remember, just to review your common so topics, the made the monster should, a companion. Should, should Victor have made the monster a companion? No, he wanted a girl friend, bride of Frankenstein. Um, and okay. so, oh my gosh, that <laughs> sentence was throwing me off. Like, made him his friend, or like, what? So, yeah. so, I thought, do you understand? Yeah. Okay. Um, and one reviewing our common topics. One of the one that would be really good to use here is I think it's um, relation. Is that the one? It. So we consider what what happened before, what happened after, and specifically what might have happened what might have happened, which we have to use our imagination. We do know what happened with the choice he made. We don't know what would have happened. So, anybody want to give me, and let's start with, yes, he should, he should have made a companion. Anybody think of a good, reasonable argument that he sh really should have? Matthew, what do you think? If he would have made him a companion, he said, I would have gone out like in the forest and whatever, and he would have lived in peace and he wouldn't have killed anyone else. Okay, so we're gonna call him C for the creature, okay. so I don't have to write the creature every time. Um, C would leave and not bother people um, and uh, who, who would have lived then? Who all would have lived? The two kids, well the one, no it's just one. No, that happened before. Yeah, that happened before. before. Even though he'd I heard already some... killed, he'd already killed. What's his name? The the young younger brother, Victor's younger brother, not Ernest, the other one. Why can I not think of his name right now? I don't know. Yeah, Jacob. I just want you to know, to know with me, I take it on my phone because I can't really keep up because I'm a slow. Oh writer. no, that's fine. So, okay. That's it was fine. William. William, thank you. Yeah. I felt like it started with a W. Matthew okay, so William right. was already dead, <laughs> and Justine was rule. already executed. <laughs> when they had so he could have saved for last. So who else died? <laughs> What's his name? Um, the one, <laughs> Sa <laughs> Safi? No. No, um, no. You, uh, I know. The one, the I know. one made. It's been a while since we read it. Henry. Uh, the Henry, yes. Henry would live. Um, Elizabeth would live. His wife, cousin, that's weird. Um, his dad, you know, kind of died of, of grief. It sounds like he just dwindled away after Elizabeth. His dad would live. Um, Wait, Henry is little brother, like his little brother? No, Henry is his best friend. Oh, okay, because I was thinking, because I was thinking, because his little brother was already dead by the Yeah, time. Henry's his best, Henry Clerval. That's when he accidentally choked the kids, so that one, the little brother. Well, it didn't sound like he accidentally choked he him. He said it was to silence him. Yeah, but, he but then he was lifeless. Yeah. He said, well, he dropped it at his feet moments later. Yes. He thought it was the son of Frankenstein yeah. because of the last name. Yes, and he, but he He's a said sibling. though he may have not realized he was actually going to kill him, try and silence him, but he said, "Ah, then you shall be my first victim," which doesn't sound good. No, sounds. Um. Good. So he threatened him. What else might have happened if he had made them a companion? Maybe um, they would have gone on a rampage and had double the power. Well, that seems like a negative. So let's. Oh. <laughs> I'm, I mean, I'm they, they would have started a, like a 
like, well, they would have had kids, so then it would have been like a continuation of the. May double, they may double ramp. We can't call it double rampage. You know what that means, right? Yeah. Instead of one of them rampaging, two of them are rampaging, and they can kill twice as many people. Um, what if they had kids? Their kids could be vicious. They could be even worse. Double the power and offspring. However, here's a here's the thing. He's making the creature. Couldn't he make her so she couldn't have any kids? I was could, thinking. I was make, thinking through that. He could make the wife um, sterile, for lack of sounds very clinical, but so she just can't have kill children. Um, well, you know, I kind of wonder. So why did Victor do this whole project in the first place? Well, <coughs> I mean, he had multiple reasons, I think, but. Why did he decide he, he wanted, wanted to give life to a creature? He wanted to test it to see if he could do that with his mother that died. Ah, uh, so he, he may... That, and he wanted to have something that set him apart from everybody else. Okay. Like his own invention of only he knew how to do, and he ha he would have get the fame and recognition, <coughs> and he could bring his mom back. Yes. Mm -hmm. So think of what happened um, on the, the, the path that he chose. So the, the, the monster ends up destroying himself, right? So he's gonna commit suicide, he's gonna set himself on fire, whatever, up in the Arctic. But what if, you know, he'd, he'd reached some peaceful resolution and then Victor could release his research and maybe then his research could have helped other people. So you kind of follow my line of reasoning? Like the, the path he chose, it was all for nothing because the monster just, dies and nobody ever knows about it except for Walton and Walton's sister and whoever they tell. But what if he could have um, benefited science by making his uh, achievement known? Of course he still, I guess he would have had to fess up to the whole William and Justine thing. Well, what would have happened if he tried to put the creature in the prison for murder? He seems awfully strong. What if he could break the window? Probably. I mean, that could go under the end. Like, the problem could be stopped. Okay, oh, I like that. Um, too strong to be stopped. However, again, if he can make the wife sterile, he could also make her weaker and smaller. So she can't do as much damage if she takes a liking to doing damage. Hmm. Can you think of any other, well, something good that might have resulted from him making a companion? What do you think, Carl? Well, if you look back at Genesis, how did they have to eat? So what's that proof? If anything, that would be worse because I man, he's a companion. Because Eve was the first one to bite out of the apple. Mm -hmm. Ooh. So that could be a reason not to. Uh, okay, so if 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 Just say their Adam model, yeah, if their model is Adam and Eve, Eve may be worse. You kind. Of, Phrase that however you like, you know, if that's not clear, if that won't jog your memory. That's good. I think what else could have happened? What might have happened? Imagine the world um, where he it. took the companion and he, he and the other creature are both living somewhere in the wilds. Not for a selfish gain, I guess, but um, the creature would be happy. Okay. And does Victor not sort of owe him some sort of happiness? Mm -hmm. Certainly the creature thinks so, right? Like you, you were my creator, you're my God, I'm your Adam, and you abandoned me and you owe me. So let's summarize that. Um, the creature would be happy and, he and it. Victor owes it 
to his, I'm gonna put, I'm gonna call it his child in quotation marks, okay? It's kind of like his child. However, flopping over to the other side, we can revisit this if something occurs to us. What if they don't want to leave? Victor brings this up. What if, what if she doesn't want to leave? What if she, we'll just call her she, all right? She means the hypothetical wife. I call her wife. W, <coughs> just for W wife. wife, good. What if she doesn't want to leave society? Do you, does anybody remember another what if that Victor thought of when he was first arguing about it? Why does everyone hate the creature? Because he doesn't look good. <laughs> He's ugly. Do you remember what Victor said about a potential mate? Oh, she would think he's too ugly and what want to be with humans. What does she think he's too ugly? She may reject the creature and go for somebody a little better looking. Of course, on the negative, we, we know a lot about the negative because that's the choice he made, right? Mm -hmm. So what was the fallout? What happened because he made this choice? What are some negative things that happened? Well, I mean, we could do the same thing with the other one. As yes. People died. Everyone Death. Died. Death to Henry, Elizabeth, and even uh, himself. Dad. Yeah, himself, the creature. Um, also, uh, uh, well, I, I'm gonna put this over on A. Um, he, Victor could live a happy life. You know, maybe if, if all had gone according to plan, he could have married Elizabeth and they could have just gone on and everything would be hunky-dory. In this, um, one, it obviously ended in no happiness for mm -hmm. anybody. Except poor Ernest, who's left alone with no family members living. I think, I think we should put that on there. Ernest abandoned. Let's not forget poor Ernest. there while we just kind of meander through the plot and think if we can if anything else comes to our attention I mean I guess for the end it would be just kind of like the deal with like if you put your name into a drawing sure there's a small chance that you could win but it's a better chance than having no chance so I mean for the end you could say there's no chance of him Really okay, I like that. Of anything so turning out good. Here we have small chance of success. And by success, I mean happy ending, happily ever after. Here we have no chance of success. Of course, okay, so but on the other side, in, in this case, the, I don't like to sound the like I'm- The fallout isn't as bad. Well, yes, yes. Because the, the hit list is, is narrow. Like the creature goes for his loved ones because the whole point is to torture Victor. But what if she like just wants to rampage in general? What if she just becomes this massive serial killer and she just doesn't care? <laughs> they would kill, go kill people together. Yeah. Bonnie and Clyde. Bonnie and Clyde. Um. So, so um, could turn into, we're gonna say that, Bonnie and Clyde. Although it would not be as that would be on the Clyde, end and there'd be no stealing of money. That would be on the end column. Yeah, It'd right? be stealing of lives. Well, they could steal wealth on property. Oh, that would be on the end column. So, okay, so, Wait a minute. 
So in the negative, okay, so on the negative side, carnage, we're gonna say this carnage limited to Victor's loved ones. Well, see, that is backwards, though. Yeah, okay, if he had not, he did not make the creature, but the creature, okay, no. But if you did a yes, then, I mean, there's a yes. chance that the, the, I guess, carnage would be nothing, and nothing would happen, but if that went the other way, then it, then a whole bunch of people would die. It's pretty yeah. much, the A column would be, well, yes, there would be a chance of success, but if the chance of success was yeah. missed, I guess it would guess be a lot worse than yeah. the end column. That's too confusing. We're just going to leave it with small chances. <laughs> My sugar-coated brain is just not going there today. You could um, also replace A and N with the happy ending or what happened or what would. Let's leave it up there, and then let's see. I'm going to turn the camera back to my seat. Um, so, I don't know. My copy of the book, which is just like Maggie's apparently, does not have this. But it has a subtitle. This book is called Frankenstein or... What about you, Lauren? Does yours have a... Um, I do not have that. Or like on the title page, if you open it up to the title page, does it say Frankenstein? My book. The modern oh. Prometheus. Or oh. the modern Prometheus. Wait, Who's this? Prometheus? I think I, I just read the story. The one guy who was cursed by Jupiter to forever roll up a stone up That's ahead. Sisyphus. Sisyphus is the rock. No, was he tied to a rock and then have his liver be liver <laughs> by a crow until Hercules came around one day because he Hercules owed him a favor. Yes, which is a pretty nasty thing to do to someone. Um, this is a copy of Edith Hamilton's mythology. That it's did, just that sort of just brings up a video game that recently came out called Phoenix Wright. Great. Okay. Call back when first Clement in his epistle thought uh, Phoenix was a real bird. Yes. But you know what? Maybe they were, or maybe they're just extinct. Mm. All right. Anyway. <laughs> just, just I hate the ancient people getting nagged on because they <laughs> wrote goofy stuff. Like, you don't know. Maybe they just aren't here anymore. Okay. Back to Prometheus. Here's the story of Prometheus. Um, this is, she's talking about the creation. This is the Greek mythological account, okay? Um, the world has been created, and now they're ready for it to be inhabited. By, all, by now, all was ready for the appearance of mankind. Even the places the good and bad should go after death had been arranged. It was time for men to be created. There is more than one account of how that came to pass. Some say it was delegated by the gods to Prometheus, the titan who had sided with Zeus in the war with the Titans, and to his brother Epimetheus. Prometheus, whose name means forethought, was very wise, wiser even than the gods. But Epimetheus, whose means afterthought, was a scatterbrained person who invariably followed his first impulse and then changed his mind. So he did in this case. Before making men, he gave all the best gifts to the animals, strength and swiftness and courage and shrewd cunning fur and feathers and wings and shells and the like, until no good was left for men, no protective covering, and no quality to make them a match for the beasts. Too late, as always, he was sorry and asked his brother's help. Prometheus then took over the task of creation and thought out a way to make mankind superior. He fashioned them in a nobler shape than the animals, upright like the gods, and then he went to heaven to the sun, where he lit a torch and brought down fire a protection to men far better than anything else, whether fur or feathers or strength or swiftness. According to another story, the gods themselves created men. They made first a golden race. Um, I'm going to actually stop there. So Prometheus, and this is the crime for which he is chained to the rock and having his liver eaten out daily. 
he stole fire from the gods and gave it to Nina. And it was supposed to belong to the gods. What did Victor, how, how is Victor the modern Prometheus? It's because only God can give life, or God creates life, and then Victor was trying to create life in the image that he wanted. God is the life giver. And I like that what you said, in the image that he wanted. We are created in God's image. I wonder if the Greeks would say, I don't think the Greeks would say Prometheus created man in his image or anything like that. Um, Prometheus means forethought, thinking ahead. I got a plan. I'm gonna make these guys, gonna give them the fire. Epimetheus is the doofus, you know, like <laughs> always, oh, that didn't work out. Now I need to, somebody to clean up my mess. I guess my question arises then, how forethinking is Victor? Like, I mean, he does he seek a plan? Future wealth and stuff. Okay, because he because he was going to get famous from giving life. Okay. He also kind of has has the same punishment as Prometheus. Like, so often in the book, one of his loved ones dies. So yes, it's kind of like he's being similar. tortured. He is being tortured. I mean, that's the whole the creature's point, right? Like I'm gonna I'm gonna torture you. You created me. I also tortured you because you abandoned me. Um, or more or less broke. But then you know, there's this this. I think we talked about this um, in December. He he creates life, and what's the first thing he does? Abandons it. Abandons it and does what? Takes a nap. Takes a nap. He, he goes into the sa- at it because he, it's ugly. It, like he didn't notice that while he was creating it. Well. And then he was like, I was like, oh, I think I'm tired. There isn't a crazy big beast in my house. I think I'm tired. Yeah. And then he gets to take a nap and, and the beast goes up and says, Yes. Hi. Seventh day of creation parallel. What, that he rested from his labors? Yes, on the seventh day. However, God didn't have a rampaging. Big beast out of the moon. God did create dinosaurs. Yeah, so they're not going to kill him. I under, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I personally think that in all the films I've seen in Frankenstein, they don't make him scary enough. Because it's just, I don't know. Like, he's not in, like, as insanely grotesque as he sounds in the book. Yeah, he's like this mm-hmm. big, lanky, yellow creature, like, on more his green. book. Is it so. more scary to have the movie Frankenstein, like, the, oh, oh, you know, like, he's not, That's he's not, funny. he's not, doesn't seem intelligent or rational, or to have this thing that's, like, we talked about, it said he visited slaughterhouses. The guy's got animal parts. We don't want to know what parts. We just... I want to know, yeah. but and, and didn't they have it walk up and say, "Well, I would like to have a talk with you about philosophy and life and paradise yeah. lost," and That's which what, is creepier? I, I think it's creepier that there's a big intelligent creature out on the loose. Like he's intelligent. Okay, like strong. a zombified thing that doesn't know how to do anything. It's kind of scary because it doesn't know how to like do anything. It's easy on this part of it, but you have a very the intelligent huge eight foot beast that is zombified looking at you but it is also very very intelligent which is pretty odd so it can be devious it can be intentionally cruel and the movie one is never very like his hand-eye coordination isn't the best you know what i mean he's a little awkward is that and this guy's like climbing cliffs and Oh, like it's, a it's the, that's terrifying. The, like, that's the main writing a mess. Like people just assume <laughs> about Frankenstein and just like, or rather Frankenstein's monster and just screw it up. Cause like everyone's like, it was dead. Now it's not dead. So it must be a zombie. Here's a zombie. Oh, we yeah. don't have to bother creating a Frankenstein's monster. We'll just give him of the appearance of a yes, zombie, but it's yes. not a zombie. No, it's, it's not. It's something if anything, worse. I don't a know. A better representation would be somebody of my stature with like 
Something taller than Carl. Imagine something taller than like Carl. Carl? Terrifying. Like Carl? Like Carl? Like Carl? It's dead Carl. That's oh, much harder than him. That's him. awful. Foot taller. And I'm six five, so that would be seven five if you were that a foot. Okay. Last time, my class yesterday, one of my students, I guess we were just all over the place, and he said it was like we were channel surfing. You know, it's like we just get. <laughs> I just kept clicking the channel, We're clicking the channel now and moving. Last time I asked you guys about this comment that the creature makes. I was benevolent and good. Misery made me a fiend. Make me happy and I shall again be virtuous. And I asked you, I remember Naya, you talked a little bit about this, what uh, the relationship between um, misery and sin, I guess, misery and being bad, um, misery and vice, <coughs> and obviously the creature is of the opinion, I only do these bad things because I've been mistreated. If I am treated well, I will do good things. What, after, now that you've read the whole book, do you want to add anything, like, what does that leave out of the equation, if anything? Like, kinda, is that? I mean, after reading through the whole book, it kind of feels like he's kidding himself. Like, mm. I feel like it kind of is like he doesn't really believe that because, I mean, he keeps on doing all the bad stuff and, like, doesn't care. He's like, he doesn't try and make himself good throughout the book and amend himself. He's just like, it's like how some people feel about sin. Like, well, we're all sinners, so I might as well go and sin. Mm -hmm. So it's like if you don't sin every once in a while, Jesus died for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, th this is interesting because, you know, after well, Victor dies on the ship with Walton, the the creature comes and visits him, and he's talking to Walton, and he says this: um, After the murder of Clerval, I returned to Switzerland, heartbroken and overcome. I pitied Frankenstein. My pity amounted to horror. I abhorred myself. But when I discovered that he, the author at once of my existence and of its unspeakable torments, dared to hope for happiness, that while he accumulated wretchedness and despair upon me, he sought his own enjoyment in feelings and passions from the indulgence of which I was forever barred, then impotent envy and bitter indignation filled me with an insatiable thirst for vengeance. I recollected my threat and resolved that it should be accomplished. I knew that I was preparing for myself a deadly torture, but I was the slave, not the master, of an impulse, which I detested yet could not disobey. Yet when she died, Elizabeth, nay, then I was not miserable. I had cast off all feeling, subdued all anguish, to riot in the excess of my despair. Evil thenceforth became my good. That, here, go ahead, Matthew. What were you going to say? Oh, I, I wasn't necessarily on that. So it says, the alternate title is saying that Victor is the modern Prometheus. Okay. He sounds more like his brother. Epimetheus. Epimetheus, because of his lack of foresight. Yes. He did not see. He should have made an A and I chart. I'm just saying. See how much, see what value these are? If you ever take in your head and, you know, give life to some hideous creature, make a chart first before you act. Um, no, he doesn't seem to have the foresight. And the big thing here in this thing I just read, he doesn't, like, what? Yay, I've given something life. Now I owe it something. And what might happen if I withhold what I owe? Yet here, going back to what you were saying, whether the creature is, I mean, he's, he's past repentance. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like it started off on this vendetta. But then this when he says, I, ca I cast off all feeling and evil became my good. And when I read that, it made me think of that Bible verse that I'm going to have to paraphrase because I don't have it memorized. And it's um, that God doesn't tempt anyone to evil, but we are tempted we, when we are dragged away and enticed by our own desires. Um, okay. Um, 
do not say when you are tempted, I am being be- I am being tempted by God, for yes. God cannot be tempted with evil, and God, ooh, God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one, but, but we are tempted when we are lured and enticed by our own desire. Good. And then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings, brings forth death. The creature allowed himself to be dragged away and enticed by a desire for vengeance. And then there, and this is his own confession. He says um, he was not miserable anymore. He had subdued all anguish and cast off all feeling. He just didn't feel anything anymore. He just doesn't care. And it just made me think of um, like what happens to human beings like when they are pulled away into some an individual sinful act or a sinful lifestyle or just, you know, fall away from God. It sounds like the pathway. Remember, the creature said he was the Adam. You know, we talked about that. He was his Adam. Like, and desire has dragged him away from his creator. But his creator abandoned him. And that's a different story. So there's a lot of parallels between creation and this story. If you remember, when God created man, he was perfect with free will. Only because of man's free will that he did the bit. So in the story, Victor freaked uh, the creature. Thus, the creature himself is imperfect to begin with. Because yes, because his creator is imperfect. Mm-hmm. Does, does the creature problem. have free will? Seems like it. It seems like it, but a man cannot bestow free will only God can. So and technically the creature shouldn't be such being created. And this is the problem that we had last time when we discussed the first half. The idea of is uh, when did Victor get the power to bestow a, a soul mm-hmm. on a, you know. Because, I mean, you could make it, I mean, I understand, like, well, of course it, you can you can make um, a heartbeat and lungs breathe, and but it would just be, like, in a coma. It would be yes, brain dead. Yes, we have dead. machines that can do that. It would be yes. brain dead because... I mean, it doesn't have a personality. How he got it to be a person is totally like, yes. There we go. Well, so in, we a, could in, a, in a sense, it's, it doesn't have a soul and it doesn't have a free will because it's like an animal and it only goes off instinct. Well, but then that so kind of undercuts is, our whole argument that, you know, he's he's arguing that if you had followed another course, I would have made different choices. And that wouldn't really be instinct, though. That would be a rational decision to say, yes, you gave me a partner, you gave me a wife, and now I will persuade her to go off with me. Do you, do you think, do you, and this is something, do you think he... Wait, wait, did the monster say that? Yeah. Okay, well, from his perspective, it would look like a choice. But it's really just his instinct forcing him to do that. Well, we don't know necessarily if it is his instinct. He does say choose a lot in his, when he's talking to Victor. He does say choose. Mm. So, I mean, that m- kind of makes you think he has a free will. Tell, telling Victor to choose? No. Telling, he, he's oh. describing his choices. Okay. His first one. I'm going to go back. Hmm. So it kind That's of, tough. He kind of pretty yeah. much says that he has his own free will. Hmm. So, but if it's if Matthew is is on the right track and he's just kind of a glorified animal, because Victor doesn't have the power of bestowing soul spirit, um, and he's just acting from instinct, then he couldn't choose, and then he wouldn't be able to make plans, and therefore he couldn't assure Victor that by giving him a wife he would go off and be peaceful. I mean, if he's violent from instinct. He can't choose to be peaceful suddenly. Does that make sense? Mm, yeah. But if he's but a free will, if he's a free will willed creature with a with a soul with a rational ability to choose, then he can choose. He can say, "Okay, you have done what I asked. Now I will do you what I promised to you." Mm-hmm. So it makes it. It would make a big difference. Yeah, it's like the, the the ability to look forward and make deals and stuff like that. Yeah, animals don't look forward and make deals. Yeah. We're reading Cicero right now, and he says the difference between uh, humans and 
animals is that humans look forward and backwards and decide what's good and what's useful, while animals only focus on the present and mm -hmm. only think of what's useful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And he does, I mean, it's, uh, so, so here's kind of a joke, though. We've, we said that Victor is um, not, doesn't have the foresight that we would like him to have, maybe. He doesn't really think out the consequences of his, his actions. Maybe he's more Epimetheus. The creature, on the other hand, seems to have a lot of forethought. Mm -hmm. Like, he seems to be very forward thinking. Here's, here's a plot, a troubling plot point, but um, how, how does Henry end up dead on the, on the beach in Ireland? Um, you know, True. Victor. Wasn't he in like Scotland or something? Yeah, they were in Scotland. And, um, you know, Victor, okay, here's a lovely example of the whole Epimetheus thing. He tears up the woman. You know, he decides. He sees the creature leering in the window and he rips her to shreds and he loads it up and he's going to go dump it in the ocean in the middle of the night. <laughs> yes, everything yeah, that, uh, that face you just made. Um, and then what does he do after he dumps the body parts overboard? Do you remember? He he doesn't he take a nap? What is it with this guy and taking naps? And no, I'm... Oh yeah, so I know there's 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 Scotland and England and there's Ireland, but it's the Atlantic Ocean. I mean, I know it's kind of, and he lays down in the boat and he takes a nap out in the middle of the ocean. And then he's like, where the heck am I? Yes, he wakes up, oh, what happened? The wind has blown me. Hello, yes, you're on the ocean sleeping in a boat. What did you think was going I mean, that's when you so just decide to take a nap in a boat on the ocean. Like, that's so scary. That's so open and just water and everything. Like, that's terrifying. So he ends up in Ireland. We, I just, he ends up in Ireland, and Henry's body has already been deposited there. How did the creature know he that he was going to nap in the boat and end up in Ireland? I mean, he has been following him, so maybe he was watching. <coughs> Because it maybe. did say that he followed him through caves and stuff, like, all the time. So maybe he, like, killed Henry, and he had him in a boat, he and he was watching him. him, and he was, like, sailing after him while he was... And I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. There's maybe a troublesome timeline swim. there. Maybe. Yeah, I heard somewhere that the timelines don't match up between um, him going off and watching that one family versus the time that it takes uh, Victor to recover from his illness. That there's a yes. timeline mistake. Okay, so... Oh, go ahead. Go. Or it's just a logical mm. discrepancy. Maybe when, what's his name, fell asleep, Victor, Frankenstein took the boat and pointed it towards Scotland and then just went to Scotland Ooh. and dumped the body. He's super strong. Maybe he swam, like, That's he right, just like swam and pushed he it. Might have, I mean, because, let's see. That's Scotland good. is here. Ireland is, like, up here mm -hmm. this way. Mm -hmm. So there's a pretty big gap there. Mm -hmm. And him sleeping, he couldn't, I mean, unless there was like a huge wind, he couldn't have drifted very far. It's not super far. I mean, it's it's conceivable, but yeah. I like the whole so maybe human, Frankenstein human was just motor like, thing. It's like what Dash does in The Incredibles. <laughs> in the water. Um, so I read some essays about, you know, critical essays on Frankenstein. You know, and you start reading literary criticism, and some of it gets pretty out, <laughs> out there. there. But there was one. This was very intriguing. What if? <laughs> okay, so remember what we're reading. We are reading Walton's letter to his sister, where he is recording everything that Victor said when he got I on the boat. I think I know where this is going. You tell me. Where do you think it's going? Frankenstein wrote the letter. Or, I mean, um, what's his name? The creature wrote the letter. Okay. Never Ooh, mind. Well that, oh, no, I, I like that. I like that though. Some people were spec apparently there's a a large contingent of people who speculate on the fact that what if there is no creature and Franken and Victor made it up? <laughs> no, just before stay with me before. Before you completely diss it. So look, think of the people who died. Okay. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna start 
like Riaggi, and then you, when you see the pattern emerge, and you will, William, baby of the family, well loved, living at home after my parents sent me off to the university. Elizabeth, the girl who killed my mother inadvertently, I realize, but still. Henry, his family always seems so nice, and he's always so doggone cheerful, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, isn't everything beautiful? He doesn't seem to be haunted by that, get what, whatever it is that haunts Victor, you know, that makes Victor have that personality even before the existence of the creature. Um, so what if he killed them himself? What if the creature is Victor's alter ego? Like Jekyll and Hyde? But at the beginning of the book, they see a large creature on I a know. bomb sled go by. I know. And so th then you start to wonder, yeah, but Walton, he's trapped in ice with a bunch of guys who are trying to mutiny. I know he sees the creature at the end, but maybe, maybe he just saw a polar bear in the distance. Maybe he's and then maybe Victor got on. On a bobsled? <laughs> maybe he's this going is the a little side crazy. of polar bear that drinks Coke. <laughs> this is an upscale polar bear. He's a long way away. I don't, I'm not saying I really believe this, but it well, is intriguing that the creature, you know, like there are people that, like, in a deep, subconscious, ugly, dark level, Victor might have, you know, a love hate relationship with. What are we going to say, Carl? Well, the new. Thermia is the scale of social love. You can do the same. Uh, you can't see. Uh, you can't see melt, uh, mental images like you do in the desert. See? From being dehydrated. As a matter of fact, you do get more dehydrated in the cold than you do in the summer. Walton might have lost it. And then maybe he heard this whole creepy story and then he just imagined he saw the creature in the cabin after Victor died. Maybe. I don't really believe this. But That's what were you Or maybe. <laughs> I'm just, what's his name? Um, the whole deal with like maybe Victor is killing everyone all by himself. What if Victor, I mean, this is like it's out there, but it's like. He could be like the Hulk and just like. He could be the Hulk. You know, Justine. Oh boy, no Justine, you know, he has, yes. he has to marry Elizabeth because it's set up, but maybe he has a thing for Justine. And he's irritated it with just her for like existing. What, what about if he tried to actually weird. bring the creature to life, but instead something happened to him and he got sick? And then something, something I don't know. Anyway. If, he, if he made the creature, why didn't he like mutate himself? You know, he could have been like a king or whatever. He could have been like no, no. all powerful ruler. This is just something for like a theory. This is theory worthy. It's 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 a little weird. Um. Oh, you should have seen it. Um, I think it was. This is like the theory your house where, where like everyone like has like <laughs> weird theories no, the about like The Harrison Ford life. plays Han Solo and Indiana so. Jones. So when I think it was my brother Han Solo is frozen in carbonite, oh, he has of dreams theories. of him being yeah. Indiana Jones. Yeah. Oh, oh, I love it. I love it. Okay, back. I'm clicking my remote. Back to the channel. We're all going to watch the same channel now. Um, at the end of the book, we are back to Walton. You know, Walton is again telling, uh, uh, sending letters and giving um, information about what's going on with him. And he, there's this very interesting place. Um, he, his crew comes to him and they demand that when the ice breaks up, Walton heads out. We, we are not going on this expedition anymore. Remember at the beginning of the book, Walton wrote this letter. It's like, hey, I picked the toughest guys. They're just up for anything and all hardships and glory and blah, blah, blah. And they're like, no, we want to go home. Yeah. You promise us to turn back. And this is what it says. Victor hears them. Turning towards the men, he said, What do you mean? What do you demand of your captain? Are you then so easily turned from your design? Did you not call this a glorious expedition? And wherefore was it glorious? Not because the way was smooth and placid as a southern sea, but because it was full of dangers and terror. Because at every new incident, your fortitude was to be called forth and your courage exhibited because danger and death surrounded it. And these you were to brave and overcome. 
For this was it a glorious, for this was it an honorable undertaking. You are hereafter to be hailed as the benefactors of your species. Remember he said that about the creation of the, the creature. You might, the people will hail me as a benefactor and this new species that I create. Um, your names adored as belonging to brave men who encountered death for honor and the benefit of mankind. And now behold, with the first imagination of danger, or if you will, the first mighty and terrific trial of your courage, you shrink away and are content to be handed down as men who had not strength enough to endure cold and peril. And so poor souls, they were chilly and returned to their warm firesides. He chews them out for, think about what they're doing, for giving up on the path that would open up new knowledge, new science, and bring them glory. Isn't that what he was doing? And hasn't this whole thing been a cautionary tale about the dangers of pursuing knowledge know, and danger at, no, at, you know, never minding the cost? That's so hypocritical because what did he just do? He just made a creature and instead of talking to it and trying to find knowledge about the creature, he abandons it and it leads to his demise. Mm -hmm. Whereas these people are like, okay. It's also kind of... Maybe he abandoned the creature because of its freakishly good looks. <laughs> he was, he was like, jealous. Like these oh, people are doing the same thing. They're like, okay, we started this, but yeah, we could get all the way there eventually, but it would probably kill us. Yes. So let's not do it. Yes. He's like, no, keep going. Like, mm -hmm. so you guys are pansies, basically. When he's been warning people not to do it's that like sort of thing. The, um, kind of deal with the... Yeah. <laughs> He's been singing all day. <laughs> it's like the analogy with um, like the parable of the sower. It's like some, some seeds fall on the path, some seeds fall in amongst the weeds, and they've got, they get planted, and they grow up, and they're all strong and ready to go, but then the moment hard times come, they get choked out. Mm -hmm. and so it's kind of in line with that section of the parable, kind of like, um, kind of like, you go strong into it, and but then when the first hard stuff comes, then you get choked out. But he's not asking them in this case, is this something you should be doing? You know, in that case, in the in case of the parable, it's a good, you know, the gospel is a good thing mm -hmm. that we want to persevere. But these people want to persevere in something. I'm not as bad as bringing life to a creature that's going to go on a rampage, but Walton is asked, being asked to put the lives of these men on the line for doubtful knowledge, but he turns right around. This is the next, like two pages later. He says to Walton, seek happiness in tranquility and avoid ambition even if it be only the apparent, apparently innocent one of distinguishing yourself in science and discoveries. He just chewed the men out for wanting to turn back, but he did, now he's telling Walton, don't be ambitious for scientific glory because it will lead you to a bad place potentially. Which is it, Victor? He's a Which, little messed up. He's a little messed up. So I guess my sort of ending question on this is, does Victor, is Victor repentant at the end? I know it's gone, he feels bad. He feel, I mean, he's miserable because all these people have died. But that's not the same as being repentant. Is he sorry for what he's done? I don't think he is. Why not? Because like, obviously like, instead of fleeing the area, he would have probably, he could have thought of a way to kill the cr creature so that nobody else gets hurt. Or he could have mm. try to been compassionate to the creature so that he didn't have to kill it and nobody else would get hurt. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like he he, didn't he go never to tried to think of a solution to the problem. He yeah. just, his solution was, okay, I'm going to run away with my life because that's worth more than all my family who has died 
So he, he, go ahead. He doesn't really think of, like, he, I guess it, he really felt, felt sorry for what he had done, I guess. I mean, repent, if he felt really repentant about what he had done, you would expect to see more like, hey, I'm going to fix this now. Yes. But he's kind of like, um, bye. <laughs> yeah. You know, here's, here's an option. Here's an option, like not ever say, here's an option that he could have chosen. V is the companion. If he doesn't want to create a new potential um, hazard for the world, hey, how about he sacrifices himself? He's, he sacrificed everybody around him, maybe unknowingly, but nonetheless sacrificed them. How about he sacrifices himself? And he goes off into the wilderness with the creature, and I he just, becomes its friend. Would the creature even want that? The creature can't well, eat him. Yeah, and Victor would have to overcome a lot of... I mean, this creature has killed his wife and his brother, and it, you know, I mean, there'd be a lot to overcome. The creature seems to want those companionship. I think, I think it might, okay, this is me speculating. It seems to me when I read that the creature might be more willing to accept Victor if, than Victor would be to accept the creature, like to overcome the hurdles of his looks and his, his, his background. But the creature just seems... Mm -hmm. uh, maybe not there at the end where he says I've cast off all feeling but through a lot of the book at the, at the moment right before he rips up the second creature all right he's kind of got a, 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 a I can't think of the word you know a, he's got a, a basis of, of communication with the creature okay I'm listening to you I'm trying to think of your needs what if he had just gone outside when the creature was looking in the window and said hey you know what I can't do this but here's what I can do you long for a father, you long for a relationship with your creator, which is what we want, right? As human, we need a relationship with our creator. I will be there and I will let you have a relationship with your creator. It seems to me at that point, the creature might have taken him up on it. Yeah, uh -huh. And if you think about it, at the, at the point where he's, yeah. he's making this decision for our A and I chart, um, Henry isn't dead. Elizabeth isn't dead, and his dad isn't dead. The only people that are dead are Justine and, um, oh gosh. Uh, William. Yeah, William. Why can't those we are remember the only poor two, William's name? The all, those are the only two people that are dead so far. So it's kind of like, yeah. he doesn't have a huge thing against the creature yet. It's not like he was making this decision after Elizabeth was already dead. Yes, yet. yes. Cause considering that, he might have been able to have a pretty good duo of a lumberjack. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think of it like this. At that point, when it was just those two people that were dead, if he had gone and like been compassionate to the creature, the creature probably would have accepted him, of course, because that's what he wants. That's what he thinks is wrong with him. Because, I mean, he doesn't know better or like anything else. Yeah, he has. He's very like knowledgeable but he just imagine if you were the only thing like you were the only species of your kind comes into a world of a bunch of us and no one shows you compassion nobody shows you any sort of once into a relationship with you I mean I think I would probably wall out and kill a bunch of people too I mean that's just what I would do I mean <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, Hopefully not. No but friends. I understand. <laughs> no friends. <laughs> yeah, but like, if you think of it that way, if he got the one Don't go thing that my he family. feels that is missing to him, like a relationship, because that would be really lonely. You're your only kind, and you're by yourself. Then he might have changed, and the, the solution that might be the solution to Victor's problem. Or he could have just killed the creature, and that would have been the end of it. Instead I mean, of running from it. What do people do when they're lonely now? I mean, they often turn to death, but not death of other people, just the yeah, killing well, of themselves. And sometimes death of other people. I mean, the, the stories of mall shooters and stuff like, you know, school shooters. It's like the outcast kid that comes back and takes everybody out. So you heard those two shootings that happened at the mall? 
Mm-hmm. You hear about those? Uh, wait, was this recently? Somewhat. Yeah. yeah. Right. It wasn't that long ago. Oh, wait, at, at the North Park Mall? Yeah. Yeah, I heard something about that. I was at the mall both of the time. Oh, gosh. Hmm. Did you hear there was a shooting at Chuck E. Cheese? Yeah, 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 they yeah. shot. What I a terrible place story. to go shoot. Did you hear why? I, unless they're shooting. I don't think they're about shooting. No, I'm not. Did you, do you know what why? Animatronic. Is that the place where they have? Yeah, no. the, yeah, the, yeah. Where yeah they the, can the shoot those. I'm sorry. Do you know why that shooting happened? I do not. A lady shot another lady for tickets and left her kids there. Yeah. Wait, hold on. Say that again. Well, she shot so, the lady in front of her kids. She shot the lady in front Both of her kids, kids, and the kids just got left there. Yeah. Over some tickets. Because she wanted to get that it's up awful. in Snakeville to stop the show. Well, what? okay. So what? here, let me bring this back oh, to an idea. That is the most messed up thing ever. Yeah, I've been, I've idea, been trying to get from you, like we've been discussing responsibility for, for one's actions. For, for example, does because people are mean to you, does that give you a right to be mean to other people? Is that right? Yeah. But here's here's something. <laughs> no. Um, is that what we are destined to become without a relationship with our Creator? Hmm. Well, if our if we do not now in our case, we're the ones who turn our backs on the Creator. Right? Mm-hmm. The creator doesn't run away from us. We run also, away from our creator. If we didn't have a relationship with our creator, the Christian faith wouldn't exist because our creator would just be like, oh. You and we would have no standards faith. for virtue or what is right, what is yeah, wrong. Yeah, so I, in a sense, we would turn out a lot worse if we didn't have a relationship with our creator because we wouldn't be saved from our sin. We wouldn't have any hope for the future. And so, I mean, that would make me depressed. <laughs> so I guess, you know, we think about these news stories. What, what if you thought of them as these creatures that are like Frankenstein's creature, you know, that are like driven by not instinct. I can't. I can't go as far as Matthew and to say that. Uh, maybe I was. That wasn't like thing. my opinion. Oh, okay. That was just, just something just, I was throwing out. Yeah. Um, but. But lacking. I don't even want to say guidance because it's more than that. I don't know. A relationship. Anyway, just because people who do these things, I mean, should we should not pity them? Oh, they couldn't help it because they grew up in such a bad environment. No. People grow up in bad environments and don't go shoot people. However, people there is a certain amount of pity people. that they deserve because they are lost. They have no relationship with their creator, and so they have no ability to make those judgments or restrain themselves. I don't know. That's an interesting thought. It's very hard. I'm a judgmental sort. That is that is one of my failings. I'm a judgmental person, and whenever I say, you know, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, boom. I need to pay attention because I'm hard. I judge. I judge myself hard, and I judge other people hard, and that's wrong because the merciful shall obtain mercy. You know what I mean? So I know this is is not a good thing, and when I hear these stories, it's like, oh, a bunch of losers out there. The whole world's full of losers, and that is that may be true, but that's not the right attitude. It is oh the horror of life without God, mm-hmm. the horror of being aimless, wandering, practically like Victor asleep in that boat. That's what their lives are like. Yeah. They blow me wherever you know, like well, to this mean, land, to that land, across the sea. I don't know where I'm going. Well, you gotta think that's how the creature's life was too, because he had. No hope. He had nothing. He didn't even have companionship. So he had literally nothing. So he was just like, okay, cool. What do I do? I'm going to kill all the people that this guy cares about. So maybe he'll see me. Mm -hmm. And I think that sometimes those young people that do that, so, so they will see me. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah, right. either media attention, attention or like a lot of like kids, like that's why they always end up in prison because people say it's because how their parents treated them. It's like yeah, that's some of it, but it's a lot of it. It's not really how they treated them. It's like how much attention they gave them. 
Because, mm-hmm. like, as kids, that's all that the kids look for is attention from their parents, whether they do good or wrong. That's why they always end up doing that bad, because they're doing whatever they can to get their parents' attention. Yeah. If they don't get any praise for the good, exactly. they'll get right. blamed for the bad, but at least it's some sort of attention. Yeah, Carson, what are you um, going to say? The whole thing is, I mean, I guess this story is kind of a bit more challenging than the other ones to discuss, because this is, like, the first, like, science fiction book mm-hmm, I mm-hmm. think pretty much ever so it's the kind of it's kind of like um, the author can make it or in this case Mary Shelley could make it however she wanted like she could make I mean with science fiction books you can do whatever you mm-hmm. want really so it's kind of like this is the first but remembering that this is the source of this story is just doubling back to her, someone with a problematic relationship with their father at best, a dead mother, and um, and obviously not a um, God fearing environment, you know. And she took that, and this is what she came up with. All right, because of time. We are going to close down our discussion of this. I would like you to begin a paper on just answering, should he have made the companion? We have a lot of information here to, to, to go from. However, you other things may occur to you. We're going to spend two weeks on this paper. Okay. Um, I have for you, uh, I don't know if I already gave you away these or not. Are we writing the paper this week? No. To, well, okay. you can start writing if you want to. What I want to do is give you a chance to start Wait, working whether on... whether he should have made the first monster or the second monster? The second monster. Whether he should have made a companion for or the creature. The first monster. Okay. Is everybody got... Is that clear? Um, I have got an arrangement paper for you. We did our invention sort of together, although you might find some new things as you reflect on it. Um, this is, the front part of this is sort of a very, very, it, it, it's going to look very familiar to Lost Tools of Writing, but on the back, I've given you an outline. I would like you this week to at least work on your outline, you know, jot down ideas, group ideas, and um, if you want to start writing, that's great, but bring it Bring what you've got done back with you next week so we can discuss it. I can answer questions. If you're having trouble finding good proofs so you're not sure how to organize, we can discuss it that way, okay? Um, let me, here, I don't know how many I'm grabbing. I'm probably going to get some, so just send them around to Lauren. So the, the, uh, the side that says outline is probably going to be more, and it's just going to look, it's just going to look very familiar. Right. So, with Victor being the companion, you could have had Victor go with his uh, people and get the pies to the both of them, and then you could have the creature do all the work of chopping trees and have the creature become the English version of Paul Bunyan. You could. They could have put their, their heads and bodies together and had quite the bang-up business. Um, we are starting something completely different. Jane Austen's Emma. Oh, I love this. Thank you. I have a student on Tuesdays, and she hates it. That's disgusting. I know. She's like, I hate Jane Austen. I hate this book. Okay. Okay, I kind of don't. She doesn't say it like that, by the way. I kind of don't like. Okay, just a second. Um, What? Go ahead. Kind of. Okay, I really don't like books that are just like about ordinary life, like little men, little women. I despise those books. Okay. So, oh so let me, uh, let me, before I go to Matthew, let, let me just say that we're going to address this. There are no car chases in Jane Austen books. Nobody's going to die. Nobody's going to get shot. Nobody's probably even going to need a Band-Aid <laughs> in the Jane Austen books. But I propose to you that just because nothing major happens, it doesn't mean nothing is happening. So if you already love Jane Austen, yay right, you can be my, you know, helper here. And if you're not wild about it, and you're like, oh my goodness, I have to take some no dose, whatever, to get through this. I need lots of coffee, Red Bull, to help me through this book. I'm just going to lose it. I hope to be able to show you 
that there are things that happen. I want you to read chapters 1 through 13. It's a fourth. Lucky it's number. a fourth of the book. We're going to read it in four weeks, okay? And which book is this? Emma. 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 Because you guys had read. Uh, some of you had already read Pride and Prejudice, and I didn't want to repeat, and so I chose Emma. Yeah. But well, I like Emma. Did we read both last year, Lauren? Because I know we read Pride and Prejudice. We only read Pride and Prejudice. Um, I thought we read it though. Pride last year. I may have done Pride and Prejudice the year before that. Well, one thing I one thing I'd like you to think about as you read the whole book. We're not going to talk we're gonna talk about more towards the end, but I just like you to keep this in mind. Um, in early 19th century England and America, there were very strict codes of etiquette and conduct. Okay, um, for instance, uh, calling people by their first names rather than Mr. or Mrs. Whatever was not. You had to be on very intimate terms with someone. Um, how you dressed, how you presented yourself, visiting people. There are these very strict rules. We live in a very casual society, right? We dress casually, we live casually, we talk to people um, on a very familiar basis and call them by their first names almost immediately when we meet them sometimes. And so what I'd like you to do is just notice that. And I would like you to think about the pluses and minuses of both of those. Like, what's good about Jane Austen's system? What's the downside? And likewise for us, what's back. good about being a casual society, but what do we lose it makes because of that? people feel more, um, I guess, recognized when you call somebody by their first name. So well, keep that, keep that, get, let, those, let those thoughts simmer over the next few weeks. I have as our supplementary handout, um, this is a, uh, excerpt from a book called The Idea of the University by John Henry Newman, who was an Anglican priest who became a Catholic cardinal later. And but this is about what is a gentleman? What makes a gentleman? He's living in the mid-1800s, okay? And uh, so read this, and then as you look at the various men in Emma, see how you how you see this lived out or not lived out. You can, again, pick a, pick a few and send them down to Lauren. And with that, I will let you go. Please bring, bring your outline, bring your questions. I don't want anyone to get a writing assignment and feel like you're just floundering and you're not sure what to do or how to put it together. That's why we're not just doing it in one week. That's one of the reasons. my paper or I'll just email it. Okay, that's fine. And I will stop our recording. Goodbye.